Our second reading this morning from the book of Acts comes from that second volume of Luke's two-volume work, the first volume being the Gospel of Luke, and the second volume being the Acts of the Apostles. I mention this because to really appreciate this wonderful little story, you have to turn back to the first chapter of Luke's second volume, the book of Acts. The risen Christ has been with his disciples for almost 40 days. It is almost time for his ascension and his followers are being prepared by Jesus for their mission to bring the gospel to all the world. Don't leave town just yet, Jesus says to them. In just a few days, all heaven is going to break loose. This is what you heard from me. For John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Well, sure enough, on the day of Pentecost, the same disciples are transformed from a motley group of wimps who are jumping at their own shadows to a fiery cloud of witnesses. They pour out of their meeting place, speaking the languages of every resident and every visitor in Jerusalem that day, proclaiming the mighty acts of God. Clearly, the Holy Spirit was worth waiting for. Well, that's in chapter 2. But here in these little verses in chapter 19 of the book of Acts, we run into some Christians who do not know about the day of Pentecost. Think of them as sort of half-baked Christians. There are a few of them around today as well. Apparently, this young evangelist named Apollos had been to Ephesus and had convinced some that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, but it turns out that Apollos was woefully ill-informed about the rest of the gospel. He knew about baptism, but only the baptism of John the Baptist. So this couple named Priscilla and Aquila gently take Apollos aside and try to tell him the rest of the story, but apparently he leaves town before the believers in Ephesus can have the new Revised Standard Version of the gospel. So, along comes the Apostle Paul. And he runs into this group of half-baked believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? He asks them. No, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Well, in what baptism were you baptized? Oh, in the baptism of John. Well, that, that's fine so far as it goes. But John baptized with the baptism of repentance telling people to believe in the one who is coming after him, that is, Jesus. Oh, the people say. <laughs> and that did it. Paul baptizes them in the name of Jesus Christ, and as he is laying hands on them, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they start to prophesy and to speak in tongues to beat the band. It's the day of Pentecost all over again. I love this story for many reasons, one of which probably never occurred to the writer Luke. I love it because it reminds me of my first pastorate. Like Apollos arriving in Ephesus, I arrived in the little town of Alta, Virginia, Alta Vista, Virginia, just sure that I knew everything that I was talking about. And like Apollos, I... I needed to be taken aside and lovingly shown that I was not nearly so knowledgeable as I thought. In Apollos' case, the couple that helped were named Priscilla and Aquila. In my case, it was Bruce and Francis Harvey. When I came to Alta Vista, I had three graduate degrees, including one doctorate, but when it came to fleshing out the gospel, 
in the living community of believers, I needed Bruce and Francis to show me the ropes. Looking back on it now, I didn't realize that was also a kind of baptism in the Holy Spirit. The other reason I love this story is because it reminds us that we, the church, the baptized people of God, are always a work in progress, constantly being reformed, forever being shaped and reshaped by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our baptism, as Martin Luther used to say, begins here at this font, but it does not end until we die. Each of us individually, all of us together, a work in progress. What does that work in progress look like? What are the signs of the Holy Spirit at work in a community? How do you spot the baptized? What should we see when we look in the mirror? What should the world see? What should God see? Suppose a stranger should arrive in Tallahassee today looking for the baptized. What might he or she look for? Well, judging from this story, the stranger might first look for people who speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues. Another way of saying this is that our stranger might look for translators. That is, for folks who communicate the good news of God's love for the world in a language that the world can understand. In some cases, that requires a spoken language other than English. For most of us, however, that means going beyond words to communicate in the language of love, God's love for the whole world. God's love can be proclaimed in words and should be, but it must also be proclaimed in action, and that's another language. In my experience, this group of believers gathered here today, you're fairly fluent in that language of love. In these past few days, as the temperature has been plunging to unfloridian uh, extremes, I have been recalling that winter, I think it was 1986, when this congregation started Tallahassee's first cold night shelter. I remember going in a borrowed pickup to a storeroom over at Tallahassee Memorial Hospital and digging out the spare cots the Red Cross kept in that storeroom, loading them up into a borrowed pickup and brought them over here to the basement of the education building. Some of you today remember moving the furniture out of the preschool classrooms on cold nights and taking it over to the other room and then setting up those army cots. I remember the first night we opened, Kent Miller and Bud Hendry were there. The two of them stayed up all night long while our guests from the streets slept warm and safe. It's hard to imagine a language more eloquent than that. You want to find the baptized? Look for those who speak in tongues. The second sign that we might suggest our stranger look for to find the baptized comes from that other half of Luke's sentence. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. That's the ticket. Look for prophets. Not fortune tellers. <laughs> prophets. In Luke's writing, prophets are not people who foretell future events. For Luke, prophets are those who talk about the present. They're the people who speak in God's name about God's work in the world. 
Prophets point to the evidence of the Holy Spirit at work and they cry, look, do, do you see that? We need to join the Spirit in doing that. Take, for instance, that shelter I was talking about. After that first winter, some prophets took that ministry to the next level. Some of their names were, let's see, Joe and Jane Schaefer and Tom and Abby Potter and Christy Kuntz. They said, well, this is a good start, but God wouldn't want us to stop there. God would want us to take it up a notch. And so they did. Next came, over time, a year-round shelter augmented by communities of faith from all over town. And eventually, a few years later, people got together and built the Kearney Center. On the coldest nights of last week, the Kearney Center welcomed in 400 guests. The most we ever welcomed when we started, I think, was 12 or 14. <laughs> if it were not for prophets calling for compassion, forcing us to look homeless neighbors in the eye, holding leaders accountable, there would be no Kearney Center in Tallahassee. And it's very likely that last week, several of God's precious children would have perished in the cold. Prophets don't just speculate about the future. They don't just point fingers at injustice. Prophets lead marches. Prophets attend city and county commission meetings. Prophets speak the truth to power. Prophets see the Holy Spirit at work in the world and they roll up their sleeves and join in. As soon as those half-baked believers in Ephesus received the Spirit, they started speaking in tongues and prophesying, and it wasn't long before they too were part of that movement that is still turning the world upside down. Want to find the baptized? Look for the people speaking God's love for the world in action as well as in words. Look for prophets who are not afraid to keep, get their hands dirty. Look for partners with the Holy Spirit. John A. Broadus was a teacher of preaching back in the 1860s. He said that baptism is called the door into the church. And that's true enough. Baptism is the sign that God has claimed us and engrafted us into the body of Christ, the church. But Broadus said, baptism is more than that. It's also the door into God's vineyard where there is work for all to do. It's the Holy Spirit who opens both doors, the door into the church and the door into God's vineyard. That's why every time we baptize, we ask the Holy Spirit to empower everything we say and everything we do. We did that just one year ago when Emilio was baptized on this very day, the baptism of the Lord. Paul, we didn't know there is a Holy Spirit, said those half-baked believers. Paul soon remedied that. I sometimes think that you and I need to be reminded that there is a Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who is at work in the world right now. Look for the Spirit at work, beloved. Look, remember your baptism and join in. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.